Today on Tangential Soup, we're going to be taking you over a couple of topics. The first one we're going to talk about is the Australian Census, which was taken in 2016. Um, just look at some key points uh, on, on that. Uh, then we're going to be sharing some travel stories. Um, I have a few of those, certainly. <laughs> But before we get to that, I'd just like to do a quick piece of follow-up regarding the book I spoke about last week. It's called Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World by Kel Newport. It's a very interesting read and I suggest people check it out. How did you go with your email this week? Uh, so I, I, I have been following um, on from what we were saying and uh, I've, been, I've been closing down my email. Um, it's it's it definitely helps. I think I need to really get a lot better at it though, because I'll find that I'll I'll look at it in the morning, then I'll close it off, which is fine. But then I'll reopen it around lunch, and I have trouble closing it again after that because, like my calendar, and um, I, I keep a lot of things in in my Outlook. So um, I think I need to get better at storing things off my Outlook that I might need to use. Um, throughout the day so that's that's really the only problem or the main problem that's kind of popped up with that okay um, yeah otherwise it's it's going well it definitely helps without a doubt a little less distracted oh yeah a lot less distracted and i think as well it's just me uh shifting my mindset and not thinking that things that are sitting in my email are actually urgent because obviously i've got my bau that i've got to take care of and that's What's really BAU? Take priority uh, business as usual business as usual okay so just my everyday everyday yep. stuff that i've got to do um and that's really has to take priority over everything that's not urgent i think and then afterwards the things that kind of pop into my email which are as i've said mostly not urgent um then they get dealt with after after everything else is done yes i think that's a sensible way of doing things the only thing with me is like i, I have work that comes that it has to be done in the afternoon and work that has to be done in the morning. So I actually just have breaks between that that I think I've got to dedicate to my email. What has to be done strictly in the afternoon versus the morning? Is that meetings and things or? No. So um, with our company, we get uh, we get our unit prices in the afternoon for our, for our investments. So certain processing can only be done in the afternoon. Oh, um, okay. I authorizing on that processing. So yeah. you're waiting on data to come in. So you can't do it beforehand. Exactly. Right. Yeah, okay. It. Okay. So on to the census. This census. Yes. Um, I noticed there was a lot less Jedi this time around. There is a lot less Jedi this time around. So uh, we have pulled, or I have kind of pulled a lot of this information from um, the Business Insider article. Yes. I was just going to read by it Chris Pash, published uh, 27th of June, 2007. Yes. Um, so basically, uh, this gave a bit of information, which I've kind of I've kind of broken down a bit. Um, now, this is something that I found that uh, delighted me a lot because I had never seen the word quinquennially before. <laughs> now, <laughs> yes, I've lived twenty five, almost twenty six years of my life without seeing the word quinquennially. But uh, the Australian census is taken quinquennially, uh, and it means every five years. Uh, and the first Australian census was taken in New South Wales in 1828. Hmm. New South Wales, I suppose, being the main colony of white people in Australia. Yes. And one of the things, one of the things that struck me certainly from uh, the the information in the census is that women make up 51 percent of the population in 2016, uh, and this is mainly because they live longer. So if you look at the uh, the data, um, the older they get, the higher percentage of the population they are. So over age 65, women make up 54% of the population. And over 85, they make up 63% of the population. Mm, yeah. So if you are a woman, you're uh, more likely to live to an older age. I suppose that makes sense. Age. Well, it does, yeah. Because, we I mean, well, I don't know why it makes sense. I'm not really sure what the, uh, the science behind women living longer is. No, so. but I mean, given that fact, I guess it makes sense that the population would start to skew that way. Although that is quite a difference. It is quite a difference. 63 yeah. versus 37. 
I can do math. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So can I sometimes. Um, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting to me. I guess that um, yeah, men just die sooner, which is unfortunate for us. It was also good to see that the Aboriginal population is uh, growing. They are growing, yes. Um, so the median, well, just to just to give you some statistics, though, they're still not even close to the average Australian. Well, no. Um, so the median age of an Australian is thirty eight years old, whereas the median age of an Aboriginal person is twenty three years old, mm. which is unfortunate. Uh, but the median age from uh, for an Aboriginal, uh, I think in 2011, was 21 years old. So the median age is increasing, which I think is generally good news. That's what we want to happen. Yes. Uh, another thing that, uh, that kind of interested me was the country of birth for uh, that Australians reported, or that people living in Australia reported. So... I wouldn't have thought that England would have had such a high percentage, but basically it goes Australia is, or country of birth is Australia, uh, 66.7%. England is 30, or 3.9% rather. Hmm. So um, it's quite a high percentage. Yeah, that is actually surprising. I mean, I would have picked Australia and New Zealand and probably China as being up Mm. there. But Mm. England is interesting. Although it seems to have dropped off a fair bit from 2011. Yes. So I wonder why that is. I'm not really sure to be honest. Maybe just more people taking the census. Mm. Yeah, and China has 2.2% as a, as a country of birth. And um, New Zealand also has 2.2%, with India having 1.9%. And uh, I guess the rest are just other. Yes. <laughs> not worth a mention at that point. <laughs> no, well, I guess not. Still quite, quite significant, though. It's about 25% of the population are just other. Mm. And finally, just for just from my notes, the other thing that struck me was um, single parent families are up from 1991. So in 1991, single parent families were at 13 percent. Now we're at 16 percent, and 80 percent of those uh, single parent families are females raising children. Yeah, which makes sense, I suppose, just generally speaking. Yes, the bastard but, men f- flying the coop. Exactly. Yes bloody men um yeah and that's that's what i took from the census from that from that particular article um i'm sure there's a lot more interesting information in it for anyone who's who wants to pour over it all i also enjoyed the fact that we're up to um 30 percent of people that say they don't have a religion at all so i think we're making good progress from that an increase from 13 percent uh back in 91 I, w- I would actually agree with that, to be honest. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice it's nice to see it see it going that way. Well, from my mind, I mean, I know that religion serves a very big role in a lot of people's lives, but I certainly think that it uh, does more harm than good. Yeah, I I agree with that sentiment. It was an improvement upon anarchy back in the day, but yes, uh, <laughs> not a great thing overall. So it's it's positive to see almost a third of Australians. Uh, agnostic or atheist i suppose yeah another thing that uh struck me from that article was the uh the the divide between or the percentage or the different types of religion rather that exist in australia Mm. and uh the percentage of people that are those religions i think it's you know if you've got to have religion it's good to have a uh a nice spread between your religions yeah true a bit more of a healthy mix yes exactly not just christian Yes, precisely. Do you think it was worthwhile badgering everyone over the weeks and months and the whole kerfuffle with the uh, website going down and to get this information? Well, I mean, this 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 information is supposed to help the government and you know everyone, everyone to to better understand the Australian population so that we can better serve the Australian population. That's that's my understanding of what the census exists for. Yes, and I think that goal or that aim is probably admirable but they just ask so such weak questions why couldn't they actually ask i would think more interesting better questions because most of this data we kind of already have from other places that's actually a really good point i look i've got to say i kind of i when i was doing the census it didn't really occur to me that there could be better questions but you're absolutely right i mean they don't really 
the idea of course is to is to help people they should be asking questions around the pain points in people's lives yes i feel like okay ask the standard questions if you want but why are you asking like 90 percent of those questions i bet they have 90 percent idea of what the actual answer is okay maybe this actually clarifies it a tiny bit but i don't think it's going to make any massive changes in policy direction because of it well you're actually right yeah it was such a mess this time around. Some people didn't even get the census in the first place. And then everyone, you know, made the time after being flogged over the head, you know, you would have to do it now online. And then they couldn't do it. So, you know, yes. how many people just didn't go back and do it? Were you one of the people that uh, tried to log in on census night and couldn't? Yeah, of course. I would, yeah. M- I most, of the, most of the people were, unless you did it really early. Because I think most people, you know, it was on a Friday, I think. Uh, I don't remember, actually. But anyway, you go about your business during the day and you come home and you have dinner and you go, all right, well, I better fill out this thing before time expires. And so everyone basically logged on at the same time and it was just down. And it was down (laughs) for the next two days as well. (laughs) Because I tried again the next day and it was like, well, at this point, I feel like giving up. I did actually do it, but then that was like another two weeks later or something. (laughs) Yeah, I did mine. I, I I think I did mine about a week late as well. Yeah, but that that's on them. Like you know, while it's a hardish problem, it's not really that difficult because you know the population of Australia. Yeah. And yeah, okay, you might have it be targeted by various attacks, but something put in place by the government should have enough backing behind it to get someone in to do the job properly. It's actually a very good point. I, I don't actually know what happened to this. Was it attacked? Is that why they took it down? Or did it just crash because they didn't have the capacity to, to um, allow some of the users to use it? I think a little both. Like there was claims that it got DDoSed from people in China or somewhere. <laughs> but I would say, yes, of course, you're going to get DDoSed to a certain extent. So you probably should guarantee 10 times the capacity that you're going to need. But also, I feel like they thought, oh, the population of Australia, everyone's going to sort of be on at staggered times, probably. They're not going to hit the servers all at once, which they pretty much did. And I think that's what tipped them over the edge, which is just really dumb. Yeah, it's idiotic because people are going to finish work. They're going to come home and they're going to do the census. That's yeah. what I did. Yeah. And that's when it crashed. Yeah. And then I think I, I think I probably wasted about maybe at least an hour just following the Twitter updates, waiting for it to come back online so that I could do it. Yes. And it never did, so... Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, that day. Or the next two days. This foolishness, David. Foolishness. For our next topic, David, I believe you have some information on JST's laws changing on July 1st. Ah, well, yeah, this is just um, something that I guess, to an extent, affects me more than other people, but it affects a lot of people. You may have noticed... Are you still subscribed to Audible? I am, yes. Yeah, so you might have got an email that said, as of July 1st, all digital purchases bought outside of the US, so if you're buying from a US company or what have you, will have to charge GST on their digital products if they're selling into Australia. So that's all ebooks, that's all pieces of software, apps, games, anything that's a digital product has, up until now, escaped that restriction if it was sold by a vendor outside of Australia, but now that's no longer the case. Wow. You will still find people probably doing this because I don't know how easy this is to going to be to police, but at least all the bigger organizations are following the law and they're going to pass that extra cost onto you. So like my subscription to Audible, I can't remember what the exact numbers were, but it was like $13. It's going to go up to $15 or something. Oh, that's a bit disappointing. Well, I mean... I suppose it makes sense in a lot of ways, and the government does have to charge taxes on these things. Nothing should be exempt from tax, in my opinion, Um, but a bit unfortunate. Yeah, so that was just a short piece of news to make everyone aware that if you're suddenly being charged a little bit more on your digital goods, uh, that would be why. All right. Well, look, David, I have a few travel stories, and I'd imagine that you'd have a travel story or two as well. Uh... Not as much as you. I know you had a good one about um, a dog in a desert. Yes, I, I have that one as well. Just to give our listeners an idea of what I've done in terms of travel, 
um, when I was 19. I spent about two and a half months traveling around Europe. So uh, that was really the first traveling I'd ever done in my life. The first time I'd been on a plane, apart from a uh, one trip to New Zealand when I was when I was younger. Um, when I was in Europe, I went to mostly just the major cities around a, a few European countries. So I went to London, Dublin, uh, and then flew over to uh, mainland Europe into uh, Germany. And then I actually spent a bit of time traveling around Germany during winter, which was beautiful uh, because it was it was right around Christmas time. So they had all the, the German Christmas markets, lots of Glühwein, which is which is uh, German for mulled wine, which is absolutely delicious and the best thing to drink in winter, honestly. Um, and then I went down to France uh, and then down to Italy and spent a bit of time in Rome and Florence and then traveled up into the Netherlands and uh, spent New Year's Eve in Amsterdam. Uh, and then I flew back over to London uh, and then I flew over to Canada and I spent about five or six months living in Canada. Uh, living in a place called Jasper in Alberta, and uh, in uh, in Jasper we were right at the right at the base of a uh, skiing mountain called Marmot Basin, um, and I just had the time of my life because I like to snowboard, so I was snowboarding in Marmot Basin every day, and I was working as a houseman in a hotel during the uh, during the evenings. So that was a, an evening job. I think I started started around about three or four o'clock, and I uh, I went through to eight or nine or ten maybe something around that uh, and I made ten dollars an hour Canadian so I made basically no money couldn't even really afford food but still had an awesome time snowboarding and uh, yeah just had a great time and then after that I, I came home and worked for a bit in uh, in Australia actually quite a while for three or four years and then um, recently I spent about seven months traveling through Southeast Asia so I went to Nepal did a bit of trekking through the Himalayas in Nepal, uh, spent a while in India, and then went to Myanmar, followed by a small stopover in Thailand, then uh, through Laos, and uh, after Laos I went to Vietnam, and then after Vietnam I went to, to China and uh, Taiwan, and uh, yeah, that's that's been my traveling experience. Uh, overall I've spent, well, I guess about a year and a half overseas. Yeah, you certainly have travelled around the place. On a slightly unrelated note, but when you spoke about Canada just before, did you see that they're celebrating their 150 years of, I guess, being the current Canada as we know it? I didn't, no, I didn't actually know that. Yeah, 150 years of the maple leaf. Well done to them. Yeah. It is a beautiful country. I very much liked Canada. It's like a slightly more relaxed version of Australia. Okay, a lot snowier. Well, snowier colder. more relaxed. Yeah, yeah. Quite a lot colder. More maple um, syrup. A lot more maple syrup, definitely. That's that's a given. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that I that I really noticed about certainly living in uh, in Alberta um, is they have ridiculously cold winters. Like when I was living there, um, there were days when it was minus forty degrees. So it was actually dangerous to go outside during these days. Even you know, even if it wasn't snowing, the air was just so bitterly cold. You can um, breathe it. Well, you could breathe it, but it hurt to breathe it. Basically, Ooh, it yeah. doesn't sound fun. Um, look, do you know what? Do you know what the thing that uh, that I really noticed about going through Europe and living in Canada is they they really understand how to be comfortable in the cold. Whereas I'm sitting in Australia and in Sydney, and you know it's probably well, I don't know what the exact temperature is. It's probably around about ten degrees, and I'm freezing cold. Mm. I'm under my blanket. There's nothing that even resembles heating in this house. I've got a small like little portable heater that i turn on sometimes but you know we nowhere in australia does double glazing for windows um insulation isn't done very well no yeah we just we just don't have very good temperature control around here because i mean it's mostly warm and you don't really need it then um plus most houses that have any kind of temperature control have either split cycle air conditioners or just air conditioners that that only that only blow out cold air which is fair enough in a lot of ways but uh yeah. Is it Makes wet it in unpleasant. Canada? Um, do you know, it's... So the, the winter was really cold, as I said, about minus 40, but the summers get to about 40 degrees in the place I was, in um, Alberta, uh, and it was quite dry as well. So hmm. during the whole winter, the ground was covered in snow. It was just freezing cold. 
you know, snow was quite deep there. And um, during the summer, it all just dried up and then it became all dusty. Mm. It was quite a, quite a strange uh, change in the, uh, in the climate, actually. I was talking to a guy originally from the UK and he said one of the best things about Australia is that you can organize to go out and do things outside, play soccer, tennis, what have you, and kind of expect that you're going to be okay. Whereas in the UK, you would really have to do those things indoors most of the time if you were going to do it. Yeah, because it's rainy all the time. Yeah. Miserable. Uh, yeah, no, Canada's not like that. No, I mean, they have obviously the winter where it's freezing, but during the summer you get you get actual summery summers. Hmm. Or at least the part of Canada I was in yeah. was like that. I mean, obviously Canada's a massive country, so I'm sure it differs depending on where you live. Did you go through the States at all? Uh, no, no, I had a stop over in LA, but that's that's all I've all I've really touched of the uh, the US. Having said that, I would I wouldn't really like to go to the um, to the US at the moment. There's nothing nothing really that appeals to me there, mm. uh, and I've always thought that if you wanted to really travel through the US, uh, you can do it when you're a bit older. You know, you don't need to be young to travel through the US. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, and a couple of stories from when I was traveling. Um, you suggested this topic, and I've uh, I've been thinking about it. Um, one thing, um, it's not so much a story, but just a really nice kind of adventure experience I had, um, in a place that you wouldn't really expect it. Um, it's something called the Gibbon experience in Laos. Um, and basically what it is, is through the, through the jungles in Laos, um, I don't know who originally came up with the idea, but they've, um, they've installed a whole bunch of cables that you can zip line along. Um, through through the kind of valleys that, that exist in that area. So what you do is you you hike up a bit of a mountain to start with, um, and they kind of drive you up. Then you do a bit of hiking into the forest, and then you come you come to your first zip line. And basically, what you do is you zip line through the valleys um, in the forest uh, for about a day or so. And we did it. We did a two day one. I think there was a three day one as well. Um, and on this, when you kind of finish your first day of uh, trekking and zip lining, um, you get to a, uh, a tree house, uh, which I do have a picture of and we can put on the website. Um, but basically it's, it's, it's a tree house. They've put on this big tree. Um, it's probably about four or five stories high. Um, and you actually stay there for the night. So you stay in the middle of the jungle in Lao for the night and they have some basic uh basic things there like you take you or they take they take some food for you um and you know, some hot chocolate i think we had uh, i don't think there was any electricity there from memory um and they also have probably one of the coolest features of of this tree house is um it's kind of i think that the the house itself although it's you know three four stories off the ground is uh maybe two or three stories i, th- I think is the is 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 how big it was and um on the bottom level they they actually have a toilet in this tree house and you sit there looking over the valley in the forest doing your business and it's just the most <laughs> serene experience you'll ever have in your life <laughs> majestic oh yeah it was, it was absolutely beautiful and then for the next day you just just sit blind towards the end and then they pick you up in the bus so you know it's in terms of touristy things it's quite well known in the in the Lao area, and certainly most people that that go to Lao will try and do something similar to this. Um, but I mean, overall, it's it's just nice to go to places that uh, that humans haven't ruined yet. Mm. Um, and it's the idea behind this organisation was uh, the preservation of gibbons, which are a type of monkey. Yep. And yeah, just I think all or a decent amount of the money that's raised from these from these trips goes towards. Uh, protecting the gibbons um the idea behind the trek is that you might see some gibbons sometimes uh when we did it i didn't see any um and apparently it's not super common to see them because they're well i mean they're monkeys they probably don't want to be around you too much but um yeah very beautiful definitely recommend it to anyone who's uh traveling through southeast asia and doesn't doesn't quite know what to do mm. and that's uh done out of a place called now i can't even really pronounce it it's Huai Zay or something like that. So it's right on the top uh, Thai Lao border. Um, I got there from taking a bus from Chiang Mai. What is Lao like as a country? The rest of it, uh, very poor. 
they were the third world country. Yeah. Um, in terms of country, though, it's it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, there are, I think, the more commonly travelled places. Uh, you can go to Van Vieng, which is uh, famous for a river that runs along some limestone cliffs or mountains. I think they are cliffs or mountains. Um, and you can basically sit in a tire and take a and just travel along the uh, along the water. I think for a couple of hours was, was how long it took for us to get from top to bottom. Um, I don't tend to like places like that though because it's overrun by tourists who go there to drink. Yeah, uh, which is just never pleasant, and it's just you know that it's got that kind of gross culture where people go there and just get ridiculously drunk and. It's just the worst of humanity in a place, really. Um, there is also the capital city, which which has an interesting um, story behind it. The capital city of Laos is um, Vientiane. Again, probably not pronouncing it right. Um, so I think Laos was originally conquered by the French. Um, so it's got a lot of a lot of bakeries in Vientiane, which is a bit strange because, you know, you're in Southeast Asia and really there's, of course, there's a lot of colonial influence there because they were the, they were the people that went in there and destroyed a lot of culture. But um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of bakeries, a lot of French food in Vientiane. Um, Interesting. A lot of pretty decent food for Southeast Asia, honestly. Yeah. Um, Still Asian or were they French influence? Uh, a lot of French influence, really. Um, it's probably the main the main uh, thing. Um, I mean, you can still get Lao food, but it's just basic Southeast Asian food. So mm. rice and meat and vegetables is, is the main the main fare you get there. The staple, yeah, the staple. Um, and yeah, it was just just generally a very nice a nice experience, the given experience. And, and Lao itself is a very nice country to travel around. Um, it's not very heavily policed, so if you wanted to, you could you could buy a motorbike and uh, and travel around it there. Although it would technically speaking be illegal. Um, technically speaking. Technically speaking, yeah. But I mean, who's going to stop you? On that subject, I uh, I did exactly that in Vietnam, where exactly the same situation exists. You're technically speaking not allowed to ride a motorbike, um, but. If you are caught by the police, which I was actually at one point, uh, stopped by the police, uh, you can give them a bribe, and I bribed my policeman ten US dollars, and uh, they'll let you go. <laughs> do you want to admit to this on the air? <laughs> uh, well, yes, I do actually, because it's quite an interesting story. And I mean, bribing a police officer in Vietnam, really, he's gonna just everyday he's gonna business. come after me for that. Well, actually, I think in a lot of places it is everyday business. I will say, though, if you, for, for me, certainly, riding a motorbike around Vietnam was one of the most rewarding things I've done on my travels. It was just so awesome. You got to see the countryside. Everyone in Vietnam is absolutely lovely. It's such a beautiful country. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do as well. You can ride up the coast um, of, of Vietnam. Um, you ride through all the back ways. Uh, it's all very accessible. Um their tourist facilities are quite good too. Um, by that I mean, you know, there's there's a decent amount of places to stay. Um, most people in in the in the bigger towns can speak English, so you and um, you know they sell nice food there as well. I love the food in Vietnam. So mm. overall, very cool. Um, if you do do it, I think a lot of people start either at the top or at the bottom. So if you're starting at the top, you're starting in Hanoi. If you start at the bottom, you're starting in Ho Chi Minh City, um, and then you just go from top to bottom or bottom to top whatever uh whatever your choice is and yeah just generally fantastic <laughs> although it is illegal and your insurance probably won't cover you so uh i know that i would probably <laughs> buy insurance if i if i'd crashed my bike and died in a fiery death then i wouldn't have been covered a little bit risky i suppose look it is i mean didn't you tell yeah, me at one it, point you were like driving along at night without any lights or something yeah, so that was that was probably one of the riskier and cooler parts of my parts of my journey. Um, we were making a trip through kind of the central highlands of Vietnam, I suppose you'd call them. Um, so it was, it was a mountainous area. Um, it was about two hundred kilometers we had to travel in one day, and I and I had met uh, just on the way. I'd met uh, a couple of Americans and a French guy who were doing the same thing as me and traveling, traveling up on motorbikes. 
and um, basically we'd started the day really early. So we started at about five or six a.m. because these bikes, although they were fantastic. Um, and we'd actually bought our bikes, so you can buy a motorbike for. I think I bought mine for two hundred and fifty Australian dollars, mm. um, and they break all the time. But everyone in Vietnam is a mechanic, so <laughs> literally, you'll be driving along, you'll see a tire hung out the front of somebody's house, a motorbike tire. Um, then you can just go into their into their place, and usually they just run them out of their houses. You'll go in and you'll point to your bike and just say, you know, it's not working. They can't speak English. And then, you know, they'll change the oil or replace a tube or something like that. And then, bam, you're, um, they'll, they'll fix your bike. Um, and kind of the rule that I used to work with was is you should never pay more than about $15 to get your bike fixed. Okay. Um, so that's changing oil, maybe even changing the tire, never more than $15. And that that's quite a bit actually to pay. Um, and... Remember, I went to a place and he tried to charge, I think it was about $50 to get my bike fixed. And, I mean, usually you can get it fixed for 2 or $3. Mm. Um, but, you know, for any for any major things, a new motor, like sometimes I'll try to put new motors in your bike, um, which, I mean, I'm sure that the bikes needed new motors, but the motors they were putting in were probably the same as the old ones. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not really, not really worth it in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, it's it's quite cheap and um for these bikes they they couldn't travel more than about 40 kilometers an hour you know that was at, at maximum capacity fifth mm-hmm. gear um they all they're all bikes that said they were 125 cc on the side of the motors um but or on the side of the bikes themselves but the motors themselves i think were probably closer to the motors you'd find in a washing machine maybe <laughs> they uh they, they weren't very high powered and um so yeah we needed we needed all day to cover this 250 or sorry, 200 kilometer journey. Um, and it started off really badly because basically as soon as we started, we got a flat tire. We went to a place, got the tire changed and um, and then we kept on going and then another bike broke down. So we had another stop for about an hour and because we were going into the mountains, um, there was probably a period of about 150 kilometers where there wasn't any, there weren't any petrol stations. Um, but instead of petrol stations, everyone would sell fuel out the front of their house. <laughs> so we wouldn't have been able to actually make it on um, on the tanks of gas we had. Um, but because everyone was selling fuel out the front of their house, you know, you pay a bit more for it, but then they could just fill up your tank and that, that would be that. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we started, we got the flat and then straight away someone else broke down and then the mechanic had to run back into town to get something for the bike. So, you know, we're sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And probably it got to about 10.30 and we'd only covered maybe about 10 kilometers, um, which almost meant that we wouldn't be able to make the trip unless it was absolutely perfect. So we kind of went on and we were going well for about two hours or so. Um, I think we then stopped for lunch and then someone's bike broke down again. Um, I don't remember what it was, something to do with the engine. Um, And the mechanic had to then actually ride all the way back into the town that we'd come from get the part and then ride back. And for him, it probably only took him maybe an hour and a half to do that and then maybe another half an hour to fix the bike. Um, but at that stage, you know, we basically had no chance of getting out of these mountains before before sundown. Mm. Um, but we still kind of wanted to do it and we were willing to do a bit of traveling in the dark. So we decided we'd, you know, push on. And we're pushing on, pushing on. And then someone ran out of fuel and then we had to make another half hour trip back to the nearest place that we'd seen fuel because we didn't know whether the fuel would be in front of us or behind us because we were kind of in the middle of a stretch where there were no houses. So we just decided to go back to the place that we came from, get fuel, come back. Um, and at this point, tensions were a little high and a, yeah. <laughs> a few words exchanged because, you know, everyone was a bit on edge. My bike didn't actually break down. I didn't, I, you know, I had a couple of breakdowns along my whole trip, but on this particular section, I didn't have a single breakdown, which I was actually really proud of. I <laughs> very well. Trooper. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a really good one, actually. Um, and so we kept on going, kept on going, and it started to get, you know, towards dusk. And the guys I was with, so I was with two guys, one girl and, and myself as well, and the two guys decided to just call it quits and I think that the girl stayed with them as well so um and I just decided right you know we booked the hostel in this place and I just really wanted to make this trip but I didn't I think I probably the sun was going down and I probably still had about 75 kilometers left to travel so it was it was a long way 
And I ended up traveling about five hours when it was actually, when the sun had gone down. And the scary thing about this was, you know, it wasn't like traveling in Australia um, on roads because, you know, it's, in Australia, you come to places where there were lights along the, along the highway and there are nice highways as well. Everything's clearly marked. Whereas in my situation, I didn't, I didn't actually have internet when I was in Vietnam. So I was, I was traveling using my, um, my tablet and basically the way I did it was if you logged onto Google maps and you kept the app open on your tablet, um, it actually still gives you a GPS location of where you are. So I downloaded the map mm. and I opened the app and then it kept me updated with my GPS location without actually having a SIM card in this particular tablet. But it was very risky because if I accidentally closed the app, then I'd lose that, that GPS location. You know, you, I don't know if you could do it back then, but you can actually download regions. So they were like permanently stored on the device as opposed to just having the app open. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's probably something that I could do now, but at that stage, I, I don't know if I could do it then. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Anyway, I was, I was just basically using this tablet without any internet and it was, it was absolutely pitch black along these roads that, I mean, I had no idea where I was going apart from this, this little map and I was just following it along. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really interesting because I kind of thought, you know, like I could easily get murdered out here. I mean, Vietnam is not really a place to get murdered from, from my experience of going there. <laughs> Everyone's very nice and friendly and there aren't many murderers, especially out of the big cities. I mean, in the big cities there are always people trying to rip you off, but, um, certainly in the countryside like this, anyone that I, anyone that we met was just, just very lovely and hospitable and, and kind. Mm. Yeah, anyway, so I, I was making this trip and um, I kind of got out of the mountains at probably about nine o'clock and it'd been dark for about two and a half hours by then. Um, and I ended up on, on the main the main freeway between the Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi city. Um, and the terrifying part about this was it's the freeway or it's the kind of highway that all the trucks run along. So I was sitting there on my little motorbike kind of puttering along at 30 <laughs> to 40 kilometers an hour and these trucks, these huge trucks were just rolling past me all the time. Ooh, and, yeah. you know, there aren't clearly defined roads. I mean, it was a tar-sealed road, but there's kind of a small section that the bikes tended to, tended to stick to. And that was kind of potholy and a bit gravelly. And then there was the main part where the trucks stick to. I mean, there were other motorbikes even at that time of night on the road. Because, I mean, it's, it's Vietnam and that's, that's what they do. They ride motorbikes. Most people ride motorbikes. So there were other motorbikes and I was kind of following along with them. But it was... Still got a scary experience because I thought, you know, like something happens to me here. Yeah. Nobody will find my body. <laughs> Probably just be rolled into a ditch. And then, um, and then I, I reached the hostel at about eleven o'clock. So yeah, it was about four to five hours of, of traveling in in the darkness along this not very well made road. Um, With trucks roaring road. past. Trucks roaring past me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was that was kind of my experience, and I remember when I got there, I was quite sunburnt as well because I wasn't wasn't very properly prepared for riding on a motorbike in the sun. Mm. Um, sunburnt, I was um, a bit dehydrated, and just just generally a bit uh, yeah, a bit travelled. But it was it was once I kind of got through it, very awesome experience. I was very glad that I did it. Yes, well, I'm just fortunate that you survived the trip. Yeah, right. Tell me about it. <laughs> It reminds me a tiny bit, not, I mean, not as extreme as yours, but when I went up to Cape Trib above um, Cairns with my girlfriend, we mm -hmm. uh, we got there sort of fairly late in the day and then we had to go across the ferry and then we were driving, driving, driving. It was getting darker and darker and darker through these windy, windy roads in this rainforest. Mm -hmm. and it was so hard to see like where you were going in front of you, even with the lights of the car. And, you know, after about 20 minutes of that, we got through and then we got to where we were staying, which is a little place called PK's Jungle Village. And it was just like mm -hmm. people having a party, these like um, British backpackers, even though it seemed like we we're out in the middle of nowhere, to come to that location and then just have some terrible pizza. It was a bit surreal. <laughs> yeah, no, I can I can fully understand where you're coming from. There. You're, you've actually reminded me of that story. Um, when I was traveling through the mountains on my bike, the light kept on going out at the front and I had a torch that I was actually carrying in front of me because I didn't have any sticky tape with me to kind of stick it onto the front and, and there was no light anywhere else. Like it was pitch black 
and my bike light kept on going out. Like sometimes it'd bounce and go out and then sometimes it'd bounce and come back on again. Um, so I was holding this flashlight in front of me while I rode on the bike as well. <laughs> you, just, you just reminded me of that. Bit makeshift? Oh, it was, a lot of it was incredibly makeshift. Thank you once again for joining me, Alex. Not a problem, David. Pleasure as always. You can get in touch with us uh, at Tangential Soup on Twitter. Um, you can join our Slack channel to get involved in the conversation and suggest topics for the show. And we will see you again next week. Bye. See ya. Uh, so following on from last week's conversation about emoji, um, I did a little bit of research about how they come to be selected. And it seems like anyone can actually submit a proposal for a new emoji, but you just have to make a compelling case about why your particular emoji would be useful and also how it can be represented in a way that's distinct from all the other emoji and it's easily recognizable, instantly recognizable as whatever thing that is. Okay. And then it goes through the Emoji Consortium and then various other very large tech companies are brought in on the process to either approve or disapprove and then a final decision is made by the Unicode Consortium um, and then they're implemented everywhere. Interesting, isn't it? So you could make a proposal, Alex. I don't know well, what for. We should we should make one together and uh, submit it. Maybe. The tangential soup. Um, <laughs> I, that probably wouldn't have any traction <laughs> given our uh, lack of popularity. Well, no. So it wouldn't be related to the podcast. <laughs> we, could, we could think up something. We could think up something good. We could. Just to uh, just to throw a few ideas out there. Maybe a fireplace emoji. Is there a fireplace emoji? I feel like there may be. There's definitely a fire, but maybe not a fireplace. Maybe that would be a good one. It does have a bit um, of a festive vibe to it. Is there a comb? It could be a comb. I don't know. It rings a bell, but maybe it's just someone brushing their hair, which is possibly a slightly different thing. Um, Still. A hay bale? It could be a hay bale. Oh, maybe. I don't remember a hay bale. That's certainly mm. kind of a rural thing. They do say that they want more diversity in the emoji because a lot of it is still heavily uh, Asian-focused. Okay, okay. Mm. Um, a meat pie, then. Oh, yeah. Although they already have a pie, so I don't know how you would be able to very easily distinguish just a regular pie from a meat pie. Good point. How about a wagon wheel? Yeah, maybe, maybe. A lamington. A lamington. Now you're thinking. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm onto something there. You might be able to get um, that up. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go, Lamington. We'll put together a proposal for it. It's a big form to fill out. <laughs> okay. I guess they try to make it deliberately hard so they don't get bazillions of them. Yeah, I don't know. Well, hmm. is Lamington a bit too uh, niche, though? It's only niche to Australia, though, and Australia is plenty big. In terms of land mass, in terms of people and emoji users, perhaps. I don't know. Do they have like a kangaroo and a emu? <gasps> well, that's a good point, actually. Because yeah. if they don't, kangaroo. they totally should. Well, there you go. Kangaroo. I think kangaroo would be the... Uh, well, I can't, kangaroo is the iconic Australian animal. True, yes. Or platypus. You know what? Of the really unique Australian animals, platypus is that probably the uniquest, if that is a word, which it isn't. 